Hello, I'm Too Tight Latrec and welcome to my reading tour. I've decided that since I can't be everywhere at all times and my supply of flu powder just goes only so far and you know there aren't as many TARDISes around as there used to be, I thought I would take my book tour to YouTube and to BookTube so that I could reach all the places in the world that may be just dying for a little listen to selections from Great Escapes from Detroit by Joseph O'Malley. I'll be reading just snippets from each story over the next few months. There are eight stories, so that would be eight months. And uh, I'll leave the link below for you to purchase or to ask your local librarian to purchase for you or to ask your local bookstore to purchase for you. And uh, by the way, I will say that I have seen glimmers of people talking about the book on YouTube and BookTube and I promise not to comment on any of those videos because I don't want to influence people and I don't want to make anyone feel funny and I also don't quite know how to handle that situation so I'm just keeping mum in the particular instances but I will say thank you to anybody who has mentioned my book or who is reviewing it or talking about it or writing about it. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I really can't thank you enough. So I'll be reading actually the first couple of pages from the very first story from Great Escapes from Detroit by Joseph O'Malley. And today's story is called Too Beautiful. I don't know how I came up with that name, but I did. Too Beautiful. When her father arrived home from his wanderings down between the expressway and the river, and after she had thanked the Mrs. Johnson and Jackson, the retired correctional officers who lived next door, for finding him, Martha decided to take advantage of the high midday sun by trimming the lawn and finally planting those marigolds in the front bushes. Her head was buzzy with nerves and the handfuls of chocolate she'd eaten waiting for the girls to find her father again and bring him home in one piece. As usual, the police were no help. And how he always got so far with the limp and that ulcer on his leg, Martha never knew. It was her day off from the doll hospital where she routinely dismembered and reassembled the limbs of the dear little loved ones of dear little loved ones. She knew she wasn't kidding anyone. It was Martha's idea to scrawl doll hospital on a neatly trimmed piece of cardboard to hang over the proper repair department sign at her job in the doll factory. The factory sat next to one of several abandoned auto parts plants in a windowless brick building perched on the murky waters that sludged past a downriver suburb of Detroit. It had been a year since her demotion from production to repair after they'd successfully traced the string of cross-eyed perky Susie dolls to her station for the second time and told her they would place several unmarked sniffer employees to closely watch her work in repair. Whatever powers Martha could summon to spruce up the less inspiring aspects of her life she used. So when she spoke of her work, her move at work as a boon and referred to herself as the Surgeon General at the doll hospital, Miss Jackson and Miss Johnson were kind enough never to second guess her. In fact, Miss Jackson and Miss Johnson were very, very kind to her. They watched Martha's father on the days she worked, and they refused any pay. He keeps us company is all, Miss Jackson said in her Kentucky drawl, and Miss Johnson said, yeah, which is about as much as she ever said. Martha was beginning to take personally the fact that her father only wandered away when she was home. She worried it made her look like a sloppy daughter careless for sleeping in until 8 o'clock just because it was her day off. When they finally brought him home, Miss Johnson calmed Martha's tears with a firm hand on her shoulder. Miss Jackson bent to look Martha's father in the eye. Stay put now, okay, Joe? She leaned in further and placed her pig pink cheek against his stubbled face for a long moment, then stood up straight and let Miss Jackson lead her home by the arm. Good Christ, Dad, Martha said. You must be exhausted. She kissed him on the forehead and led him toward the couch. Do you want a nap? He looked at her with one eye milky from the cataract and one eye bright and slick from his overabundantly lubricated sockets. 
He hesitated and stared hard at her, his eyes searching for something. Finally, he said, Martha? Yes, she said. That's right, Dad, I'm Martha. And when she laughed, he did too. She sat him down on the couch and let him lie back. She let go of his hand. Another wave of contractions, contractions flitted over his face, and he said, Julia? No, Dad, Martha said. She picked up his hand to kiss, then relinquished it to let it rest over his chest. That's Mom. She's been gone for years. I'm Martha. Get some rest. He reached his hand up again and held it against her face. Soon enough, his focus receded. His arm wilted back into place over his own chest, and he nodded off. Although she was sure he'd never be able to climb the back fence, she locked and bolted the back door just in case. His capabilities and reserves of energy surprised her more and more, as the morning had proven. Two miles away! She locked the front door until she'd gotten the seeds, the flats of marigolds, the weed whacker with the extension cord, and the small gardening rake and trowel out of the garage. Then she opened the front door to let some air in through the screen, in case he woke and wanted to sit in one of the lawn chairs on the front porch to keep her company later. Even with her head between the bushes, Martha could hear her other next-door neighbor rumbling awake. Her name was Kim. Kimmy for short, she told Martha the day Kim and her husband moved in three years earlier. They were new to the neighborhood where Martha had lived her whole life, and because Kim was young and pretty and pregnant, Martha didn't have the heart to correct her. Now she knew better. Kimmy got away with far too much because of that pouty angel face of hers. Kim's three small kids had been out tearing up and down the sidewalk on big wheels for hours. Martha heard something being hurled or kicked through the house next door. She tried to ignore it while she loosened the dull-smelling earth. She dug down into its soft coolness with her bare hands and crumbled wads of dirt while feeling for stones and the roots of weeds. She plopped the stones into a coffee can and shook the weeds free of dirt before stuffing them into a small plastic Kmart bag to discard later. After a while, she straightened her back, sat on her heels, and peered over at Kimmy's front yard. Large yellow-brown spots dotted the lawn. Kimmy's habit of weakly tossing bags of garbage from her front porch to let them lay where they landed for five or six days until garbage night had leached any sign of life from the crabgrass and dandelions that otherwise grew in copious profusion there. When garbage night finally did arrive, she ordered her son, seven-year-old Dylan, and his younger sister, five-year-old Heather, to drag the bags to the curb. The baby, apparently, was still too young for manual labor. Sometimes the bags would break, and on windy days the refuse would swirl about and land on Martha's lawn. The one time Martha complained to Kimmy about her unorthodox habits, Kimmy twitched her mouth into an electric thin line, widened her eyes, and said, I've got three kids to worry about. I don't have a daddy to take care of me, and I don't have time to worry about garbage. Kimmy's way of saying exactly what she thought without first passing it through an adult filter of civility rankled Martha. She had never experienced anything like it. Martha had heard there was medication to remedy that kind of thing, but she thought suggesting to a neighbor that she seek professional help might be pushing the envelope a tad too far. What Martha couldn't get used to, she tried to ignore. Sometimes this method worked, and sometimes it didn't. The garbage issue became a sticking point for them. So that's the beginning of the first story of Great Escapes from Detroit, Too Beautiful. You can follow the link below to get it from Amazon. You can talk to your local bookseller. You can talk to your local librarian. I would love it if my if all the libraries in the world were littered with copies of my book. That would be a dream come true for me. Until we meet again, remember, the world is full of wonder. Pay attention. I'm Too Tight Lechek. Mwah.